Hey there. Welcome to the first look. Okay, I'm walking, but it's like a little sunny outside and I don't want it, I don't want to get too warm. I feel like that's going to be the challenge of this thing is that I want to walk, but I'm also not sure I need to be equipped to walk outside. I don't, I don't have the right shoes on. I'm just like, I don't think I'm there. So this is the one you're going to get. You get to see me walking around. I get to walk around but I also get to not be too warm while I do it. You don't care about any of those things. I tell you those things anyway. Welcome to the first look. So, Easter, and we're still talking about having trouble. That's the, that's the theme. So, having trouble seeing, having trouble believing, those are the things that we've been talking about. And... What I think I've connected with in this series so far is the kind of highs and lows that happen as faith happens in front of us, if that makes any sense. I like being able to tell, kind of look at the, the practical side of trying to be Easter people. <clears throat> because I like that, that mountaintop kind of feeling for a minute, but I also like the idea that I have to step out from that place and deal with the world as it is and deal with my life as it is. And, and I feel like the, there's something a little bit more lived in there and there's something that's, that I can connect with, do something with, understand get my head around. And so far, I think you all have been responding to that pretty well. So the last two weeks, we've been looking at these passages um, that kind of cover the post-resurrection stories. So because this period of time, Easter, um, is not entirely chronological, you you might remember that at some point we look at things that happen after the resurrection. But then you kind of have this moment before the ascension and then before Pentecost where they, we kind of backtrack, kind of in a way of revisiting an idea post-resurrection. So we might think about Jesus as... Um, shepherding the lost. But then when we look at it from a, a post-resurrection standpoint, it's a little bit different. And that's, that's what happens this week. So this week, we go from um, week one, we had the Doubting Thomas story. And then we jump from that to the story that's right after Emmaus. So there's the walk to Emmaus. And then there's um, them thinking maybe they've seen a ghost and Jesus eating the fish and saying, I'm, I'm real, you know, here's what it means to believe in us doing that. So now we go from those stories, we go back into John and we look at it, um, kind of like we look at these pieces of what, of what Jesus did with the lens of resurrection in our minds. And so for this week, <clears throat> It's talking about Jesus as shepherd. And I never know exactly how to lean into that concept because you don't know any shepherds, and neither do I. And so we're, we're asked to think about Jesus as someone like, who doesn't do that. And so sometimes I try to think about, like, is there, a, is there someone who is as close to that as possible that we actually know? Because, again, you know, if, if you and I lived somewhere else in a rural area or in, I don't know, Scotland or Wyoming or something like that, then you'd probably know a shepherd. I don't know any shepherds. I do know... Um, I know a, a couple people who do small farming, but I know a lot more preschool teachers. I don't think that's fair, either to the sheep or to the toddlers. 
to compare the two. But I think that you need at least some of the same skill sets in terms of paying attention and wrangling and um, being able to multitask, being able to kind of uh, think about how do I care for a group, not just one individual thing. Because uh, how you care about 30 is different than how you would how you would care for two. But of course, shepherding, in which we're going to see in this passage, has a lot more elements to it that are almost more like um, being a bodyguard, you know, because it's talking about keeping keeping them safe from what's out there. And you do that as a, a parent, but not from wolves. Like there's no, I don't have a wolf threat. Um, you know, passing cars, but the passing cars aren't, aren't out to get me um, or out to get, you know, my child. But it, I think that's the hardest part is that, is that we hear the story and some of it we naturally understand and we don't have to dive too far into what it means for Jesus to be a shepherd, he's just he's taking this kind of um, protective, nurturing, um, corralling, defensive kind of um, example and applying that to who he is. And maybe that's just as far as we need to go. So it might at this point be helpful to read the passage. So again, we've we've jumped back into the book of John. And we're in chapter 10. And then um, there's, there's a whole chapter here. Really, you could look at this whole chapter on from beginning from verse 1 all the way down through. Um, but the, the, the lectionary passage for us is just from uh, 11 to 18. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Starting in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. And that's something I wanted to, yeah, that's interesting. We're going to get to that in a second. He does not own the sheep. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I think it's a little unfair, but again, we can get to, back to that in a second. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my, my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have the other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because... I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. So one of those... Um, I like to hear talk people talk about their jobs and... You know, every day, you and I deal with people who are at work. And we deal with people who are at work even when we are going through either um, something really fun and interesting or something awful. And I think one of those examples would be like, you go to a restaurant and you're the patron at the restaurant. Well... You're having a nice time, hopefully. You know, you're maybe, maybe you're out with um, your spouse or maybe you're out with a friend or um, someone, whatever it happens to be. You're out, hopefully, having a good time. Whereas the, all the people around you who are interacting with you, at least, are all at work. You know, the, the, the host, the person who, um, you know, busses your table, the, the wait staff, uh, maybe even the chef, all of those people in some way, shape, or form are interacting with you, are, are all at work. And so this is just a day 
at work for them when it's something else for you. And then on the completely other end of that, if you've ever been in, in an awful situation where maybe you're at a hospital or maybe, I don't know, at a police station or you're talking with a firefighter or something like that, something bad has happened, right? You're, you're not having a good day. Uh, but that person who's helping you, whether they are, you know, a doctor or a nurse or someone, you know, who's on staff there at the hospital or they're at a, they're a cemetery attendant or uh, a funeral director or something like that. That's just Thursday to them. You know, they're not having an awful day. They're just working. That's just, that's their day. And so when you leave, that's it for them. Now they care about you, know, about you because they care about their profession, but they don't have the same kind of investment that they would if you were their family um, because they can't. They can't do that for everyone. They have to be able to, at some point, put their job down so that they can go and do their life because if every single day was like that, was awful, um, they wouldn't be able to do their jobs very well. And so, well, in the other element of that, it's kind of the in-between, is let's say I work at a hardware store or a grocery store. Maybe that's a good example. Maybe I'm going to work at a grocery store. And I see someone, um, I don't know, steal a bunch of food and run out the door. Well, I don't own that store. At what point am I going to run down a person for uh, soup. Like, are you paying me to run this person down? Like a, a person at Walmart who's working there, are they really going to run down someone? You know, are they going to put themselves in danger or whatever? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't say, hey, you can't take that. But like, <laughs> you, I, I certainly wouldn't expect someone who worked in retail to run after someone who was stealing a leather jacket from a Wilson's leather store if they worked at a mall. You know, I mean, it's like, at some level, it's like, no, we get it. Like, this is, that's outside of the scope. Which is kind of what Jesus is saying here. Like, Jesus understands that at some level, these aren't your sheep. Yes, you care for them. Yes, you do your job well. Yes, you make sure that, you know, within the bounds of of your profession, that you're doing that, you know, you're doing a your work for what you're being paid for. Um, but it doesn't necessarily go beyond that. And Jesus is trying to say, so it's different for me. Now, I am more than willing to take the fact that you could say in this situation that someone like me could be considered the hired hand or clergy or the you know, the priests in the temple, that they're the hired hands in this, in this scenario. And that's more than fine. I, you know, I can, I can accept that. I can accept that role um, as someone who is there to help you and care for you and what have you. But if after, you know, five years or 10 years or 20 years, if I didn't on some level put that down at the end of the day, so I can go home and be a spouse or go home and be a dad or go home and be whatever, then, you know, I mean, I would be in for, you know, an, an emotionally intolerable kind of condition because I wouldn't be able to draw any kind of line between who I am and the people that I serve, you know, that as awful as I'm going to feel if something bad happens or as, an, as invested as I am in any and all of you. I also recognize that there are places where that investment has a, has a, you know, has a line, has a border, has a, there's a, an edge there. And there are some things that I can't, can't do or shouldn't do because that's not my role. It, just like this hired hand, it's not their role. And Jesus is saying, 
that line goes away for me, not only because I can handle it, but because of who I am. You know, I'm, I'm not hired here. I am, I am this person. I am this entity. I am, you know, I am Jesus. And I think that is the place where, you know, a shepherd goes from a roll into this kind of connection. And I think even some of it gets a little bit lost because, you know, when Jesus says that, you know, he's the shepherd and they're his sheep and they know his name and that kind of thing, you know, the reason that the shepherd cares about the sheep is because he can profit from them. You know, I mean, they're not, they're not just a part of his family. I mean, that, that's where the analogy breaks down, right? That it's not just, um, if he loses a sheep, it's not the same as losing something else. Now, he might care about it in a different way. Just like a restaurant owner, you know, if you own a little mom and pop, you know, restaurant, you might care about that place in a different way than if you work as a server at an Applebee's, you know, that, that's, um, you know, you might care about your job, but at the end of the day, if Apple, if that Applebee's closes, you're just going to go down the street to Ruby Tuesday or wherever. You're just going to go get another job. Whereas the person who is invested in, in a, a restaurant, that's their whole life. That's who they are. And so again, I think any kind of analogy, even that Jesus makes, is not meant to be so exhaustive that we can't find our way out of the analogy in order to make it useful and practical. Like we don't have to get so caught up in the details of what Jesus is trying to, to say that we miss the forest for the trees. You know, we, we, and that's, I think, something to kind of get your head around. But I think that the, there was one idea in there, I guess two ideas, that I really wanted to think about. Again, knowing that this is my first look at something. The first one was that, that protection piece of it. How much we kind of rely on our relationship with Jesus being one that is protective of us, at least emotionally. That because it's kind of anchoring. You know, if there's only so much that a shepherd can do in terms of keeping us physically safe, but Jesus' presence with us is about a way of being tethered and cared for um, in a way that is, is personal, but also collective and uh, thorough and everlasting. Um, it doesn't mean that something bad can't happen or, or what have you, but it, it does mean that we know that in times of danger that we aren't by ourselves. And I think that's the piece of the protection part that Jesus is trying to, to lift up. But there was another part of, of this passage that I thought was kind of interesting. And it feels, I think it feels a little inclusive. Um, but I also, I also think I was a little bit surprised by the, the wording of it. Let's see. There was a part that says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And that sounds very close and intimate. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold that I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So then there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again, take up my life again. No one takes it from me, my life, but I lay it down of my own accord, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. 
I have received this command from my Father. Now, of course, that's setting up the idea of the resurrection. But that little part in there about that there are people who aren't of the fold, who I, I still am going to love and care for. Now, I think there's a couple of different ways to take that. I mean, I think the most obvious is like Jews and Gentiles, right? But you don't fall into that. But if we're talking about that, what kind of radical differences were there between Jews at the time and Gentiles at the time? There were radical differences. And I don't think you and I appreciate that enough, how extremely different. Now, I, I can't make a direct comparison. But imagine if we were talking about Orthodox Jews living in Jerusalem at any time and Christians or people of some other faith living in, um, I don't know, Korea or Sudan or what, I mean, on some levels, there's a lot of crossovers in terms of devotion, in terms of um, how, you know, the communities treat each other and, you know, you know, but there's some obvious, you know, aesthetic differences and lifestyle differences and contextual differences that are, that exist there. Well, you know, uh, a person who is an, an Orthodox Jew living in Jerusalem and uh, a person of faith, I don't care if they're, whatever it happened to be, living in some other part of the world, those folks could not be more different. But, you know, within, even within Christianity or even within the community that you live in, there are extremes of thought and extremes of lifestyle and extremes of experience that exist, you know, regardless of whether those people are, you know, regardless of their ethnicity or their socioeconomic background or what have you. And there, I, I don't know how to read a passage like that without reading it as one that is extraordinarily inclusive of all of those things. And I have to learn how to care about that in a different way. And I keep trying to, to think about that a little bit differently. How we want diversity, as long as you eventually become more like me, then I can handle it. You know, we call that assimilation. And I, I'm fascinated by the idea of the assumptions we make around assimilation. I don't know. I, I'm kind of working through what I do with this concept of being a shepherd and, and what makes it really um, important. But the passage itself, or the sermon title itself, is called Having Trouble Following. And so, Instead of looking at this from the Jesus perspective, I'm going to look at this from our perspective. How do I have trouble following in a world where um, maybe I don't know who else I'm with? Um, what obstacles are in my way? What are the wolves, so to speak, that are in my way? Um, what makes this hard? Um, what do I need to know about shepherds? How do I trust? How do I hear a voice? How do I understand that voice? How do I... That's kind of what I'll be talking about. So my hope is, is that we can kind of start to see this text from a couple of different angles. And we'll see, you know, what you find intriguing. Do we want to explore what does it mean to be, for Jesus to be the shepherd? Or what does it mean for me to follow a shepherd? You know, what, is it, what does that mean for me to be a sheep? The challenge of that isn't in talking about it, but it's been talking about it in a way that you haven't heard before or maybe that you don't hear all the time. Uh, because, you know, we've explored that concept of 
cheapness. Um, and again, I think we can take analogies a little bit too far sometimes, but that's what I'm going to be trying to look at. What's the, what's the trouble with following and how do we do it in 2024 in the context in which we live? So those are my first thoughts. That's where we're at. Thanks for being you. Thanks for thinking through this with me a little bit and kind of exploring it. Um, look at this text. Look at other texts that talk about shepherds. Uh, I think I'm incorporating, well, there's Psalm 23, of course, comes to mind. Isaiah 40 is something I'm using in the liturgy. Um, so just look at, a, look at a couple other texts and see what it says about shepherding. Okay. I will see you next time for another first look. Thank you for being you. Um, hey, if you, shameless plug, come to Amos on Wednesday. Um, so we're going to have some fun and food and all the things that we do. So that's for everybody. Um, so until next time, have a good week, and uh, I'll see you then for another first look. Take care.